Hello and welcome back to Baby Ellis's Stories. We now return to The Land That Time Forgot by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 5 The steaks we had that night, and they were fine. And the following morning we tasted the broth. It seemed odd to be eating a creature that should that should by all the laws of paleontology have been extinct for several million years. It gave one a feeling of newness that was almost embarrassing, although it didn't seem to embarrass our appetites. Orson ate until I thought he would burst. The girl ate with us that night at the little officer's mess, just back of the torpedo compartment. The narrow table was unfolded, The four stools were set out, and for the first time in days we sat down to eat, and for the first time in weeks we had something to eat other than the monotony of the short rations of an impoverished U-boat. Nobs sat between the girl and me and was fed with morsels of the plesiosaurus steak at the risk of forever contaminating his manners. He looked at me sheepishly all the time, for he knew that no well-bred dog should eat at table. But the poor fellow was so wasted from improper food that I couldn't enjoy my own meal had he been denied an immediate share in it. And anyway, Liz wanted to feed him. So there you are. Liz was coldly polite to me, and sweetly gracious to Bradley and Olsen. She wasn't of the gushing type, I knew, so I didn't expect much from her, and was duly grateful for the few morsels of attention she threw upon the floor to me. We had a pleasant meal, with only one unfortunate occurrence. When Olsen suggested that possibly the creature we were eating was the same one that ate the German, It was some time before we could persuade the girl to continue her meal, but at last Bradley prevailed upon her, pointing out that we had come upstream nearly forty miles since the Bosch had been seized, and that during that time we had seen literally thousands of these denizens of the river, indicating that the chances were very remote that this was the same plesiosaur. And anyway, he continued, it was only a scheme of Mr. Olson's to get all the stakes for himself. We discussed the future and ventured opinion as to what lay before us, but we could only theorize at best, for none of us knew. If the whole land was infested by these and similar horrid monsters, life would be impossible upon it, and we decided that we would only search long enough to find and take aboard fresh water and such meat and fruits as might be safely procurable, and then retrace our way beneath the cliffs to the open sea. And so, at last, we turned into our narrow bunks, hopeful, happy, and at peace with ourselves, our lives and our God, to awaken the following morning refreshed and still optimistic. We had an easy time getting away, as we learned later, because the Saurians do not commence to feed until late in the morning. From noon to midnight, their curve of activity is at its height, while from dawn to about nine o'clock, it is lowest. As a matter of fact, we didn't see one of them all the time we were getting underway though I had the cannon raised to the deck and manned against an assault. I hoped, but I was none too sure, that shells might discourage them. The trees were full of monkeys of all sizes and shades, and once we thought we saw a man-like creature watching us from the depth of the forest. Shortly after, we resumed our course upstream we saw the mouth of another and smaller river. We saw the mouth of another and smaller river emptying into the main channel from the south, 
that is, upon our right, and almost immediately after we came upon a large island five or six miles in length, and at fifty miles there was a still larger river than the last coming in from the northwest. The course of the main stream having now changed to northeast by southwest, the water was quite free from reptiles, and the vegetation upon the banks of the river had altered to more open and park like forest, with eucalyptus and acacia mingled with a scattering of tree ferns, as though two distinct periods of geologic time had overlapped and merged. The grass, too, was less flowering, though there were still gorgeous patches mottling the green sward. And lastly, the fauna was less, multitudinous. 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 Very numerous. Six or seven miles farther, and the river widened considerably. Before us opened an expanse of water to the farther horizon, and then we sailed out upon an inland sea so large that only a shoreline upon our side was visible to us. The waters all about us were alive with life. There were still a few reptiles, but there were fish by the thousands, by the millions. The water of the inland sea was very warm. Almost hot, and the atmosphere was hot and heavy above it. It seemed strange that beyond the butt rest walls of Caprona, icebergs floated, and the south wind was biting, for only a gentle breeze moved across the face of these living waters, and that was damp and warm. Gradually, we commenced to divest ourselves of our clothing, retaining only sufficient for modesty. But the sun was not hot; it was more the heat of the steam room than of an oven. We coasted up the shore of the lake in a northwesterly direction, sounding all the time. We found the lake deep and the bottom rocky, and steepy shelving toward the centre. And once, when I moved straight out from shore to take other surroundings, we could find no bottom whatsoever. In open spaces along the shore, we caught occasional glimpses of the distant cliffs, and here they appeared only a trifle less precipitous than those which bound Caprona on the seaward side. My theory is that, in a far distant era, Caprona was a mighty mountain. Perhaps the world's mightiest volcanic action blew off the entire crest, below thousands of feet of the mountain upward. And blew thousands of feet of the mountain upward and outward and onto the surrounding continent, leaving a great crater, and then, possibly, the continent sank as ancient continents have been known to do, leaving only the summit of Caprona, above the sea. The encircling walls, the central lake, the hot springs which feed the lake, all point to a conclusion. And the fauna and the flora bear indisputable evidence that Caprona was once part of some great land mass. As we cruised up along the coast, the landscape continued a more or less open forest, with here and there a small plain where we saw animals grazing. With my glass, I could make out a species of large red deer, some antelope, and what appeared to be a species of horse. And once I saw the shaggy form of what might have been a monstrous bison. Here was a game plenty. There seemed little danger of starving upon Caprona. The game, however, seemed wary, for the instant the animals discovered us, they threw up their heads and tails and went off cavorting off and went cavorting off. Those farther inland followed the example of the others until all were lost in the mazes of the distant forest. Only the great shaggy ox stood his ground. With lowered head, he watched us until we had passed, and then continued feeding. About twenty miles up the coast from the mouth of the river, we encountered low cliffs of sandstone, 
broken and tortured evidence of the great upheaval which had torn Caprona asunder in the past, intermingling upon a common level the rock formations of wildly separated eras, fusing some and leaving others untouched. We ran along beside them for a matter of ten miles, arriving off a broad cleft which led into what appeared to be another lake. As we were in search of pure water, we did not wish to overlook any portion of the coast, and so after sounding and finding that we had ample depth, I ran the U-33 between headlands into a pretty, into as pretty a landlocked harbour as sailormen could care to see. With good water right up to within a few yards of the shore, as we cruised slowly along, two of the Boches again saw what they believed to be a man or man-like creature watching us from a fringe of trees a hundred yards inland, and shortly after we discovered the mouth of a small stream emptying into the bay. It was the first stream we had found since leaving the river, and I at once made preparations to test its water. To land it would be necessary to run the U-33 close in to the shore, at least as close as we could, for even these waters were infested, though not so thickly, by savage reptiles. I ordered sufficient water let into the diving tanks to lower us about a foot, and then I ran the bow slowly toward the shore, confident that should we run aground, we still had sufficient lifting force to free us when the water should be pumped out of the tanks. But the bow nosed its way gently into the reeds and touched the shore with the keel still clear. My men were all armed now with both rifles and pistols, each having plenty of ammunition. I ordered one of the Germans ashore with a line and sent two of my own men to guard him, for from what little we had seen of Caprona, or Caspac, as we learned later to call the interior, we realized that any instant some new and terrible danger might confront us. Might confront us. The line was made fast to a small tree, and at the same time I had the stern anchor dropped. As soon as the Bosch and his guard were aboard again, I called all hands on deck, including von Schoenvorts, and there I explained to them that the time had come for us to enter into some sort of an agreement among ourselves that would relieve us of the annoyance and embarrassment of being divided into two antagonistic parts, prisoners and captors. I told them that it was obvious our very existence depended upon our unity of action, that we were, to all intent and purposes, entering a new world as far from the seat and causes of our own world war as if millions of miles of space and eons of time separated us from our past lives and habitations. There is no reason why we should carry our racial and political hatreds into Caprona, I insisted. The Germans among us might kill all the English, or the English might kill the last German without affecting in the slightest degree either the outcome of even the smallest skirmish upon the Western Front or the opinion of a single individual in any belligerent, belligerent or neutral country. I therefore put the issue squarely to you all. Shall we bury our animosities and work together with and for one another while we remain upon Caprona? Or must we continue thus divided and but half-armed, possibly until death has claimed the last of us? And let me tell you, if you have not already realized it, the chances are a thousand to one that none one of us ever will see the outside world again. We are safe now in the matter of food and water. We could provision the U-33 for a long cruise, but we are practically out of fuel, and without fuel we cannot hope to reach the ocean as only a submarine can pass through the barrier cliffs. What is your answer? I turned toward von Schoenvoltz. He eyed me in that disagreeable way of his and demanded to know, in case they accepted my suggestion, what their status would be in event of our finding a way to escape with the U-33. I replied that I felt that if we had all worked loyally together, we should leave Caprona 
upon a common footing. And to that end, I suggested that should the remote possibility of our escape in the submarine develop into reality, we should then immediately make for the nearest neutral port and give ourselves into the hands of the authorities, when we should all probably be interned for the duration of the war. To my surprise, he agreed that this was fair and told me that they would accept my conditions and that I could depend upon their loyalty to the common cause. I thanked him and then addressed each one of his men individually and each gave me his word that he would abide by all that I had outlined. It was further understood that we were to act as a military organization under military rules and discipline. I as commander with Bradley as my first lieutenant and Olsen as my second in command of the Englishmen while von Schoenworth was to act as an additional second lieutenant and have charge of his own men. The four of us were to constitute a military court under which men might be tried and sentenced to punishment for infraction of military rules and discipline, even to the passing of the death sentence. I then had arms and ammunition issued to the Germans and leaving Bradley and five men to guard the U-33. The balance of us went ashore. The first thing we did was to taste the water of the little stream, which to our delight we found sweet, pure and cold. This stream was entirely free from dangerous reptiles, because as I later discovered, they became immediately dormant when subjected to a much lower temperature than 70 degrees Fahrenheit. They dislike cold water and keep as far away from it as possible. There were countless brook trout here, and deep holes that invited us to bathe, and along the bank of the stream were trees bearing a close resemblance to ash and beech and oak, their characteristics evidently induced by the lower temperature of the air above the cold water, and by the fact that their roots were watered by the water from the stream rather than from the warm springs which we afterward found in such abundance elsewhere. Our first concern was to fill the water tanks of the U-33 with fresh water, and that having been accomplished, and that having been accomplished, we set out to hunt for game and explore inland for a short distance. Olsen von Schoenworts, two Englishmen and two Germans accompanied me, leaving ten to guard the ship and the girl. I had intended leaving Nobbs behind, but he got away and joined me and was so happy over it that I hadn't the heart to send him back. We followed the stream upward through a beautiful country for about five miles, and then came upon its source in a little boulder-strewn clearing. From among the rocks bubbled fully twenty ice-cold springs. North of the clearing rose sandstone cliffs to a height of some fifty to seventy-five feet. With tall trees growing at their base and almost concealing them from our view, to the west the country was flat and sparsely wooded, and here it was that we saw our first game, a large red deer. It was grazing away from us and had not seen us when one of my men called my attention to it, motioning for silence and having the rest of the party lie down. I crept toward the quarry, accompanied only by Whitley. We got within a hundred yards of the deer when he suddenly raised his antlered head and pricked up his great ears. We both fired at once and had the satisfaction of seeing the buck drop. Then we ran forward to finish him with our knives. The deer lay in a small open space close to a clump of acacias, and we had advanced to within several yards of our kill when we both halted suddenly and simultaneously. Whiteley looked after me. Whiteley looked at me, and I looked at Whiteley, and then we both looked back in the direction of the deer. Blime, he said. What is hit, sir? It looks to me, Whiteley, like an error, I said. Some assistant god who had been creating elephants must have been temporarily transferred to the lizard department. I wouldn't say that, sir, said Whitley. It sounds blasphemous. It is more blasphemous than that thing which is swiping our meat, I replied. 
for whatever the thing was, it had leaped upon our deer and was devouring it in great mouthfuls, which it swallowed without mastic mastication. The creature appeared to be a great lizard at least ten feet high, with a huge, powerful tail as long as its torso, mighty hind legs and short forelegs. When it had advanced from the wood, it hopped, much after the fashion of a kangaroo, using its hind feet and tail to propel it, and when it stood erect, it sat upon its tail. Its head was long and thick, with a blunt muzzle, and the opening of the jaws ran back to a point behind the eyes, and the jaws were armed with long, sharp teeth. The scaly body was covered with black and yellow spots about a foot in diameter and irregular in contour. These spots were outlined in red with edgings about an inch wide. The underside of the chest, body and tail were a greenish white. What say we put the bloomin' bird, sir? suggested Whitley. I told him to wait until I gave the word. Then we would fire simultaneously. He at the heart and I at the spine. Hat the heart, sir. Yes, sir, he replied, and raised his piece to his shoulder. Our shots rang out together. The ring raised its little. The thing raised its head and looked about until its eyes rested upon us. Then it gave vent to a most appalling hiss that rose to the crescendo of a terrific shriek that came for us. Beat it, Whitley. I cried as I turned to run. We were about a quarter of a mile from the rest of the party and in full sight of them as they lay in the tall grass watching us. That they saw all that had happened was evidenced by the fact that they now rose and ran toward us and at their head leaped Nobs. The creature in our rear was gaining on us rapidly when Nobs flew past me like a meteor and rushed straight for the frightful reptile. I tried to recall him but he would pay no attention to me, and as I couldn't see him sacrificed, I, too, stopped and faced the monster. The creature appeared to be more impressed with knobs than by us and our firearms, for it stopped as the Airedale dashed at it, growling, and struck at him viciously with its powerful jaws. Nobs, though, was lightning by comparison with the slow-thinking beast and dodged his opponent's thrust with ease. Then he raced to the rear of the tremendous thing and seized it by the tail. There, Nobs made the error of his life. Within that malted organ were the muscles of a titan, the force of a dozen mighty catapults, and the owner of the tail was fully aware of the possibilities which it contained. With a single flip of the tip, it sent poor Nobs sailing through the air a hundred feet above the ground, straight back into the clump of acacias from which the beast had leaped upon our kill, and then the grotesque thing sank lifeless to the ground. Olsen and von Schoenworts came up a minute later with their men. Then we all cautiously approached the still form upon the ground. The creature was quite dead, and an examination resulted in dislocating, in disclosing the fact that Whitley's bullet had pierced its heart and mine had severed the spinal cord. But why didn't it die instantly? I exclaimed. Because, said von Schoenworts in his disagreeable way. The beast is so large, and its nervous organization of so low a caliber, that it took all this time for the intelligence of death to reach and be impressed upon the minute brain. The thing was dead when your bullet struck it, but it did not know it for several seconds, possibly a minute. If I am not mistaken, it is an Allosaurus of the Upper Jurassic, remains of which have been found in central Wyoming, in the suburbs of New York. An Irishman by the name of Brandy grinned, by the name of Brady grinned. I afterward learned that he had served three years on the traffic squad of the Chicago police force. I had been calling Nobs in the meantime and was about to set out in search of him, fearing to tell the truth, to do so lest I find him mangled and dead among the trees of the Akasha Grove. When he suddenly emerged from among the bulls, 
his ears flattened, his tail between his legs and his body screwed into a suppliant S. Suppliant S. He was unharmed except for minor bruises, but he was the most chastened dog I have ever seen. We gathered up what was left of the red deer after skinning and cleaning it, and set out upon our return journey toward the U-boat. On the way, Olsen, von Schoenworts, and I discussed the needs of our immediate future, and we were unanimous in placing foremost the necessity of a permanent camp on shore. The interior of the U-boat is about as impossible and uncomfortable an abiding place as one can well imagine, and in this warm climate and in warm water, it was almost unendurable. So we decided to construct a palisaded camp.